Unfortunately, it wasn't a McFlurry, but we did have a DeJounte <laughs> flurry in Atlanta last night. DeJounte got his shots up early and often. 44 points on 40. How many shots? Shots. How many? Including hitting shots. all five shots in overtime. Look, Murray's mentality was just to get them up, and he gave them uh, an outstanding effort out there. And look. Where was that in the dunk contest? I don't Jaylen know Brown. where it was in the dunk contest, but oh my God, Jalen Brown. <laughs> look, you don't get a body out there on the dunk contest, but in the fourth quarter, DeJounte Murray going to work. And look, they have so many defenders on the Celtics roster that none of them, everybody's going to get that work. These are all NBA defenders. All NBA defenders, the best team in the league. And DeJounte Murray, he sees them and he just goes to work. Look at this. An over top of Przingis, offensive rebound, out. Those are, those are just dagger threes. And look, Celtics up by three, tie it right there. I, look, I, I don't know what you do if you Celtics. You take two straight L's to Atlanta, but look, I've always been a person that says, hey, these are the things that can kind of help get you locked in down the stretch in overtime. Like we said, DeJounte Murray knocking down shot after shot in the overtime for Atlanta. It was just impressive. But look, Boston's not going to go away. They're going to fight. They're going to gr grind. Jalen Brown, bucket. Celtics up by one now. Six seconds ago in overtime, Celtics up by one. Drew Holiday, I mean, that's not pretty good enough. defense. That's great defense. That I stand by the best defense versus the best offense. I'm taking the best offense. Look at Dejounte Murray going against Drew Holiday. We already saw Derek White get some of those. But look at him—he's out there dancing in Atlanta. It was just an impressive, impressive night for DeJounte Murray. What he was able to do out on the floor, just bucket after bucket. We don't have time to oh, show all, all 44 shots. I mean, we don't, we... we don't have that. But DeJounte Murray, he had some comments after the game. It's the NBA, right? That's the best team in the league. We competed, you know. Uh, we didn't use being tired or anything a back-to-back -back as an excuse we came out and competed and these are the games I want to be a part of and I still feel like I played awful I don't want to take them any shots but I know Kobe will be proud of me <laughs> Boston was a massive favorite on Thursday and they lost again which gives them multiple losses this season as 15 point favorites the only other teams to do so since 1990 both lost in the first round of the playoffs in that respective season but Joe Missoula he doesn't seem too concerned how demoralizing is we <laughs> no. come on man I'm really trying hard here to like you know it's not demoralizing demoralizing Look, I'm going to agree with them. Demoralizing is a very aggressive word, especially if you're the first place team. You're going to lose a game. You're going to lose a game in overtime. But, Zach, why is it that the Celtics' losses feel so loud? <laughs> Let's start with the good news, Richard. They feel so loud partly because there's so few of them, and they never win close games. They only win blowouts, and so we have very few dramatic Celtics moments to talk about, and they're all this. But... Their crunch time offense is too slow and too predictable, and it's mediocre league-wide, and that's not going to be good enough against the best defenses who are going to play you in close games in the playoffs. It's not a crisis. It feels like a crisis because the Celtics are the best team. We hold them to a high standard, and they don't lose very often, but just... Give the ball to Jason Tatum and everyone else stands around. Hasn't worked well enough last year, the year before, or this year. They need to get more dynamic. Why is Kristaps Porzingis just standing in the corner, possession after possession? Come up and set a screen, run a pick and pop, get the offense moving. Derek White, the best screen setter on the whole team. Run around and do some stuff. This isn't good enough. It's not a crisis. This is the best team in the East. It's all fine in the big picture, but there are going to be games that come down to this, just like these last two Hawks games, and the Celtics need to get a little more juice to their late-game offense. Yeah, they need a little bit more juice. Again, like you said, though, they're blowing out so many teams, and when they get to these close games, when they lose, everyone wants to be concerned. But Big Perk, how big of a red flag do you think these late-game issues are that keep popping up? I, I wouldn't say that it's demoralizing, but I will say it's very disturbing, especially at this moment, right? And I feel like 
we're, we're constantly, every time the Celtics play and lose one of these games, we are revisiting this conversation because they haven't corrected the problem. Jason Tatum, he hasn't corrected the problem. He's still not showing up when they need him the most in the clutch time moments. And you know this, Richard, at this point of the season, all the teams that are in the postseason or in the play-in tournament, they're starting to gear up for the postseason, meaning they have NBA scouts that are in the stands, that are watching the Boston Celtics. You know why? Because they need a game plan. And right now they look vulnerable. And that's a huge, that's a huge part of why I have concern. Because going into the postseason, you want the scout report to say, you know what? We're going to try to do this. We're going to try to do that. You don't want teams, especially your opponents in the Eastern Conference, getting any type of confidence. And when you look at the people that are walking down the sidelines, meaning the head coaches that are in the Eastern Conference, you have a Tom Thibodeau, who is a great head coach. You have an Eric Spocher. You have a Nick Nurse. You have a Doc Rivers. So, Joe Mazzula. I know it may feel like fun in games right now, but you're going to have to do your part in these clutch game moments, in these times, coaching against the other people on the other side of the uh, court. People who have little injuries like Jason Tatum have been sitting games here and there. They're just trying to get to the finish line of this regular season because, as you keep seeing, they have an 11-game lead on the Bucks. okay? The 11-game lead for second place here. They, they, It's really hard to keep that level of performance that they've had all year long when they would benefit more from making sure their key guys have time, get into the playoffs fresh, aren't burning themselves out in the regular season. The problem is when you take your foot off the gas even a little bit, you get games like this. You build the big lead, you think you can just hold it, then you get a team like the Hawks who, by the way, they're in 10th right now. I'm not, I'm not saying we, st we, look, we don't look at the bottom of the Eastern Conference play-in tournament as much as we do the West, but the Hawks are in 10th. That could be a potential first-round series again. I know that they've had that, but you don't want to give a team like that confidence, especially if it's a team you might see in the first round. Well, and the Hawks are fighting for something. Yeah. That's, I think, the thing that people greatly underestimate. The Boston Celtics come to town. Mm -hmm. You're going to have more fans there. It's going to be more energy. You're fighting for something. I get it, but to stay on the hawk. The Celtics, they might struggle late in games, but DeJounte Murray does night. Murray has three buzzer beaters so far this season, the first of which came on January 17th with the game winner over Markel Fultz to knock over the Magic. That was a big, big shot. And then two nights later, Murray had the Heat absolutely sick with this pull-up three to win the game. And it might have also been on Udonis Haslam's jersey retirement night, <laughs> so that makes it a little bit worse. And then here on Thursday night, the McFlurry continues with a huge bucket to sink the Celtics in overtime. Those are the games. When you get to beat the Celtics, you remember those for the rest of your life. And look, the Hawks have been without Trey Young for 22 games this season, and it's shown some interesting trends. The Hawks have a winning record in those games and improved on the defensive end with DeJounte Murray running the show. So my thing about this is, Perk, my question to you, DeJounte clearly plays better when he's the run running the show. So do you think it's time to kind of end this Trey Young, DeJounte Murray experiment? I'll leave it up to you, big guy. Richard, are you asking me to get uncomfortable? That's what you're asking me right now, to have an uncomfortable conversation because you can hear the whispers. And, and in all fairness to Trey Young, he had to expect that this conversation was going to come about because when you get injured and your team starts to play better without you and the guy is leading your team that played your position, this conversation needs to be had. And I think that the Atlanta Hawks is going to have to make a decision this upcoming offseason, whether they want to continue with DeJounte Murray or whether they want to go with Trey Young. Now, if they decide to go with DeJounte Murray and he is Quinn Snyder guy, there's still some interesting teams out there for Trey Young, like the San Antonio Spurs or maybe like the Los Angeles Lakers. But do I think this this duo right now has ran its course and it has come to an end? I absolutely do. I mean, look, they're 10th in the East. 
They're the 10th in the East, and they're playing a slightly better without him in the lineup, but some of that could also just be clarity, it could be schedule, it could be injuries that they've gotten guys back from, even though Trey Young is out. And I, I do think both of them will hear their name in trade talks, and the biggest difference is, quite frankly, Trey Young makes a lot more money, so it's harder to make a trade for Trey Young than it is for DeJounte, and I, and I think it's... When we get to the season, we'll see who the bidders are. I think, Perk, you mentioned those those teams. I think you'll hear a lot more teams out there because nobody outside of Philadelphia or Orlando really has cap space this summer. Um, and the only way to get a star player is probably to trade for one. And there's a lot of teams who will be interested in the services of these two guys. So I, I expect both of them to hear their names. It's a function, though, of who wants them and what are they willing to give up? Because we've now seen a year and a half of, the, of them under Quinn Snyder, and he's had an evaluation period. You have to decide, is it time to break them up? But at what cost? What are you getting back in return? I'm not uncomfortable. Perk, I don't yeah. know about you. My chair's comfortable. <laughs> My blazer's comfortable. <laughs> this is a very comfortable conversation because we've got two years of evidence yeah. now that DeJounte Murray plus Trey Young equals mediocre. They are minus 150 total points for the season Oof. with those two guys on the floor. They just don't add up to more than the sum of their parts. They're mediocre with Trey and DeJounte. They're okay, probably mediocre with just DeJounte. If there's no change in the quality of your team, you should absolutely trade one of them for as many draft picks and future assets as you can get just to stock the cupboard again with all the stuff you traded out the door to get DeJounte Murray and put this team together. Look, it's not a surprise really that they haven't taken a step back because there wasn't that big of a step back to even take. It's not a surprise that their defense is better without Trey Young. And by the way, Jalen Johnson's hurt. Sadiq yep. Bey's hurt. Onyeka Kongu's hurt. Like, the Hawks are not whole. And that's another reason, by the way, I don't want to hear this Celtics loss last night excused by the 11-game lead and their coasting. The Hawks have half their team, and I watched Thank that you. game start to finish. The Celtics, the Celtics played hard and they wanted to win that game. They were not coasting in that game. They were fired up, they were playing hard against a team that had half its roster, basically, and they still lost. The Celtics are fine in the big picture. Their crunch time offense is just okay. It's not a disaster, it needs to be better. But I just don't want these Atlanta losses wiped away as, oh, they mean nothing, it's just a team that was coasting. That team wasn't coasting last night. They wanted to win and they couldn't. I'm gonna try to wrap up the ball, but it's not. Jimmy, look at me. I'm on fire. It's NBA, I'm here. It's NBA, I'm here.